Darn, that was the longest one I think I've ever had. <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> this is Trish with Tip Home School Moms. I was just sitting here holding my breath going, wow, it hasn't started yet. Is it going to start? Are y'all out there? See, I need a better intro. This is how it always goes every time we start this way. And it's like, well, hey, how are you? <laughs> so, hi, I'm Trish. I'm with Hip Home School Moms. I'm here with Leanne from Hip Home School Moms. Say hi, Leanne. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we're interviewing Sherry Seligson today. And did I say your last name right, Seligson? That was pretty close. Selig it's Seligson. Seligson. Oh, I'm so close. Yeah. Think of Tom the Southern Selig. draw. Yeah. That's yeah. The Southern oh, draw. Wow, it hasn't started yet. Is it going to start? <gasps> Somebody, uh, somebody's listening to it. This we're hearing long. ourselves. Uh oh. Sorry, turn it off. <laughs> I don't want to hear myself. Okay, so anyway, we're here, and um, Sherry is with Apologia, and she wrote the marine biology curriculum. So, Sherry, you live in Florida, right? So, you have access to water, obviously. So, were you born there? Were you born and raised in Florida? I was raised in Florida. I moved here when I was three, so pretty much I'm a solid Floridian, and yes, i lived at the beach and in pools and around water. In fact, my poor kids, who are all born here, keep asking me, can we please go to the beach and it not turn into a field trip? Because I, I can't not make it a field trip. There's just so many cool things to see at the beach. So, yeah, we kind of live there. <laughs> I happen to be from the coast of North Carolina, and I'm a beach girl too. So you, you, there's no such thing as too much beach time for me. So you have four kids, right? Yes. So tell tell us about them. I understand all of them have graduated now, right? Yes, we have four: three boys and a girl. And our, um, we've been homeschooling for 21 years. Our youngest just graduated from high school last year. So. Um, yeah, we've completed it. I've got most of my hair left and most of my sanity. <laughs> um, most of it. Most of it, not all of it. But it's okay. And it's, been, it's been a journey. It's been really wonderful. Kind of bittersweet ending because it's been a lifestyle for us. But mm -hmm. thankfully, they're all doing things that they are passionate about. Our oldest just got his PharmD doctorate in pharmaceuticals. I, wow. was it. I know. Um, Congratulations. Big deal. <laughs> yes, yes. And then we have a, a musician, full-time musician, totally different. Um, I was going to ask if they were all science kids. So there you go. <laughs> we have a musician. Okay, I so know. keep going. Totally. <laughs> and so he's been performing with the band, and they've been touring this last year. He got his, his degree in, in um, jazz, bass, guitar. And oh. he's been performing just all over the place. They've played at the Hard Rock, and it's just been really weird. Um, and then we have a third one who is a uh, senior in college studying biomechanical engineering science. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he's going for his master's. And he's actually working with a group of students that have put together a company where they design prosthetic arms for kids uh, using 3D printers. Oh. And so wow. instead of, instead wow. of a $40,000 arm that a child outgrows in six months, they're able to print one for $400, and they can print them with all kinds of cool designs. And they've got the art department involved now, and so they presented a Iron Man arm to this little boy who loves Iron Man. And Robert Downey Jr. heard about it, and he came and was part of the presentation. It's been really cool. Now, this was my kid who built Legos, built Connects. I'm thinking we're just and he just wow. was really needy through high school. Through high school, and I'm thinking we're just not college directed, but it was just amazing how the maturity came and. In spite of me, lots of prayer. Um, wow. And then my youngest is studying um, athletic training, wants to be a physical therapist. She's my athlete and um, loves sports and everything around them. Isn't that amazing? What I mean, there you go, y'all. Everybody worries about what happens to homeschool kids and, you know, will they get into college? Not only do they get into college, they get doctorates. Hello, and mm -hmm. then they go off and do these businesses and cool stuff. So, Sherry, you have actually done four college applications. Yeah. So tell us about the process. Tell us how it felt. How, what what was the the was the welcome mat laid out for y'all as homeschoolers or what? Tell us about it. For most colleges it is. Most colleges love homeschool students because they stand out. Now but just because you graduate one and did the application for one, most people will say, well, now you've done it, now you know. But I'm telling mm -hmm. you, each child is different. Each child has different passions and skills and strengths. And so we were really reinventing the wheel every single time. 
but at don't least tell I knew, me that. I no, but at least I knew <laughs> there were some pitfalls, not pitfalls, but challenges. There's two spots on college applications that we as homeschoolers need to be prepared for, and I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, one is, is awards and accomplishments, and then the other one is leadership. And colleges want to see those things. Now, we're, we might freak out and say, well, we don't have clubs, and we don't have president of the senior class, and we don't have that. But most homeschool students are really, really able to shine in those two areas because they're doing lots of activities that they're passionate about with lots of time that they have in their high school years. So you need to be thinking outside of the box. If you've got a child who, I don't know, loves films, create a film club. Have them invite students over, watch a film once a month, and they, they plan the film, they talk about that, whatever it is, if it's a writing club or a book club or something, have them do something like that. They become president of that club, and now they've got that mm -hmm. leadership position. If you've got wow. a kid involved in soccer, your older one can work as an assistant coach, maybe helping out. They've got assistant coach for a soccer team or a football team or whatever. Think about where, ways that they can get those leadership positions. And that, and especially if it's something that they're passionate about, then that really gets them involved, and it shows helps them to shine. Um, awards, I, I recommend that you just keep track from eighth grade on of any kind of special recognition or awards they get. If it's if they're in music and they perform and they get, I don't know, some kind of award for that. Anything with athletics, um, any awards for their writing if they've entered a contest. So keep a running list of that, and that will keep you from those two surprise boxes that kind of caught us off guard with the first one. And we had to do lots of brainstorming. Notice I was taking notes. If y'all saw the <laughs> top of my head, it's because I was busy <laughs> taking notes. So y'all, yeah. just ignore me. It's important. I, yeah. I have three boys, and I have two that are in high school. I have, and and it's so ironic, um, God, God plans our lives in so such unbelievable ways that you just can't even imagine. I, I don't believe in coincidences. And so here we are literally talking about internships and what am I talking to you about? I'm going to be talking to you later in the call about internships. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, God is in the details. Big time he's in the details. And so yeah. these are these are things we're, we're literally talking and working through right now. So yeah, you, you were... Good. You were planned, whether you realize it or not, to be t talking to me right now at this time. So I'm God listening, y'all, and I'm writing too. So y'all just watch the top of my head if you have to. <laughs> so, I know I'm awful. Okay, so let's go back to you for a second before we get if, get off into all of um, your suggestions because you've got a ton, and I really want to live there for a long time today. <laughs> but I want to talk about your history because you have such a cool history. So on her on her bio, she says that she was promoted to mom, which I think is precious. Yeah. So, but your but your history before mom was just so intriguing. So can you tell us about it? Yeah, I studied in college. Um, I was a pre med major. I wanted to be a marine biologist. The college that I was going to did not offer that major, so I my majored in pre med, which actually helped me as a marine biologist. I ended up working at. Walt Disney World's Living Seas Pavilion at Epcot Center, and um, they, it's a six million gallon aquarium that is designed to be a complete lifelike Caribbean coral reef. And so I worked there as an aquarist, which is a person who works in an aquarium, and my job included collection, care, and research of ocean animals. And so one of the cool things, being with Disney, everything that they did was kind of on the forefront. So we got underwater scooters, and we got all kinds of cool devices to, to play with, but they also had an island down in the Florida Keys where we would go every summer and collect um, our animals. So I got paid to fish and dive, which I absolutely love. Um, most people think, though, that that kind of career is uh, romantic, and they imagine a marine biologist sitting on the prow of a boat, riding off into the sunset with dolphins <laughs> flying over their heads, and most of the time, I'd be picking fish guts out of my hair and smell like squid. So there's not a, there's not as romantic as you think it is, but it's fascinating. And so I absolutely loved it, and everybody thought I was nuts when we got our, had our first child. I wanted to be a full-time mom because that's what I wanted to do with, with my life. And God has been gracious because... He's enabled me to do things within the homeschooling community as a marine biologist that I probably could not have done working in that field. So um, 
it's been very kind of full circle now. Now I'm able to talk about marine biology and write about marine biology and teach about marine biology. So I love it. I know. It, it is amazing how it always pigeon toes together, even though you didn't know that it was going to do that. It, it right. ends up there. It's fascinating. So, so a marine biologist studying shark behavior, which my kids thought was the coolest thing, <laughs> the absolute coolest thing. That is fascinating. So, I, and being a beach girl, you know, I'm fascinated with that. So, mm, yeah, you, you've had the best of both worlds, I think. Well, God's been gracious, seriously. It's been pretty cool. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And you wrote curriculum for some of the big movies and all of that. Wow. Yeah, there's a family-friendly media group, believe it or not, out in Hollywood. And somehow they found me through certain circles. And so whenever they have a family-friendly movie that is um, has an educational element, they've asked me to write a companion curriculum that they offer for free at homeschoolmovieclub.com. And um, I've written for Dolphin Tale 1 and 2, which both are really good movies. And War Horse is a fabulous movie if you haven't seen it. It's great for World War I education. Um, it's just it's just fabulous. So, um, and then I've written some other ones for some CD direct to DVD releases that they've done also. So I love to write exactly. curriculum. Isn't that isn't that amazing? I mean, and that, I guess maybe that was from Disney. I mean, was that potentially from your Disney? It wasn't. It was because wow. I've written the marine biology textbook and um, had a connection with homeschoolers, and I am a homeschooler. So they they were looking for reaching out to the homeschool community, so, which isn't is that amazing. Because well, we're you were nice. Yeah, 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 that wow. is very cool. So, um, so you're a mom, obviously. Are so all your kids are are they off at college? Are they in your neighborhood college? What? We have two at home still that are okay. um, going to a local college. Okay. The oldest one is that got his doctorate is gone and doing his internship in Memphis this next year, um, <gasps> which neat. is far away. Yay! Yeah, he'll be there. So, um, and then the, the other one is. Um, doing his master's and he's not in the house. He's nearby, but he's not in the house. So it's been kind of weird. You know, I'll tell you, for those of you who have kids close together in age, as fast as they come into your house, that's as fast as they're going to leave. And it's just crazy. I don't know how to cook for two people. It's like, know. you know, I can only cook for like massive crock pot 25, you know, boys <laughs> who eat that much. So yep. it's, it's been crazy. It's been really interesting. But again, God has been gracious. It's what we want. It's what our goal is to launch them and to let them see what God's got for them. So it's been That's good. That's right. It, yeah. I, it, but it is bittersweet. I can understand yeah. that. I yeah. so understand that. Yeah. Um, and so so when next time you're in Memphis, you'll have to let me know because I'm 45 minutes outside of Memphis, so you oh. just have to let me know. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm landlocked. The beach girl is <laughs> landlocked. How yeah. I ended yeah. up here, I have no idea. So one of the things that I find um, that, that you wrote about, you wrote obviously the Apology as Marine Biology textbook, um, mm -hmm. uh, but you also wrote a book that I never expected that you wrote. So that's fascinating. She wrote Interning for High School Credit. Mm. So how did it come about? Was that because you were doing it and you're living it and so you're <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to write about it? How did, how did that come about? Yes, that actually started as a series of of comical events of what not to do to get an internship with one of our children. <laughs> and so I had a son who really wanted to get into digital design. This is my musician now. He went to, in, in high school. And so he, we were just looking. He was going to dual enroll. We were looking on their website. And they, he saw internships as an idea. And he thought, hey, I want to get an internship. We just looked at different companies in the digital media area. And there was this big company in, our, in Orlando where we live. And we just noticed it. In the next, and he's like, well, that's pretty cool. And that was all I'd heard about it. Three days later, he comes home from a class, and he says, well, I got the internship. And I was like, what? What do you mean? He walked into this place, just cold call, in his Pac-Man t-shirt and torn jeans, <laughs> and, and talked to them about getting an internship. And they said, well, do you have a resume? Of course he did not. And, but he showed them what he had done online, and he got this internship with them. And so through that, I'm like, well, OK, if you're doing this, we're going to see if we can get high school credit for this. And so as I went through that process, I came up people were asking me, well, what did you do? How did you do that? And so I made this little workbook that takes you through step by step how do you brainstorm what to get an internship in, um, how to find one, how to um, write a resume as a student who has no potential job experience, but they do have skills. And so how to show themselves to an employer to show 
how they potentially could get this internship. And what I've found is it's fabulous for a high school student to have an internship. Most students don't think about internships till their junior year of college, where the competition is heavy and intense. Mm -hmm. And so in high school, as homeschoolers, we have so much more flexibility in our schedule to be able to explore things that they're interested in. And if they do this thing for a semester and get a semester credit in, you know, whatever they would call it, depending on your state, um, they may find that they love it and they know that's what they want to do for a career. They may find that they absolutely don't. And that's good, too, because that's exactly. time in the college. Yes. That's right. Like, which is what happened to my son. So he loved, it was a good experience for him, and it looks fabulous on a resume or a transcript to college because it shows a student who has been out there, who knows what's out there, who knows what they want to do or what they don't want to do. It shows responsibility. It shows all kinds of things that are non-tangibles. Um, and so I highly recommend. Now, as parents, we have to be careful who we're putting our children under for um, mentors. And so there's some helpful hints in the book workbook on how to navigate that, how to um, you know just kind of network through your churches, through your friends, and see if you can find someone. How to how to brainstorm. You know, if you have a student who wants to be a clothing designer, what are some similar fields that might work if you don't have access to a clothing designer? So things like that, just to kind of help them navigate through that. And then there's writing activities, short writing activities, and logs of extra skills they're picking up as they're going, so that they can have something at the end that quantifies actual credit work. Mm, that's such great. Um, so where can, where can you get your where can you get your book, Sherry? Um, Rainbow Resources sells it. Okay. Um, and you can also get it directly from me from my website, just hyphen extraordinary dot com. Okay. I'll I'll put those links in. Thank you. Okay. Very good. There, I'm fascinated. I'm taking notes, y'all. So y'all just gonna have to just listen, you know, for a second. Okay. So, so when when they're doing the interviews, um, how you mentioned, you know, networking and things like that. I, ironically, I'm a head. I used to be a headhunter in my previous life before I started homeschooling, and I placed IT guys. And okay. so I did. Th I did that for 20 years. So I actually still have a website where I have, you know, how to write a resume. But one of the things that I always struggled with, ironically, was how to write a resume, what to put on your resume when you had nothing to put on your resume. So I'm actually interested in your book, <laughs> even though I was a headhunter. Everybody I worked with always had experience. That was the hardest thing. Was once they, um, if they came to me and they said, "I have no experience," it's like. Okay, let's see what we can do with that resume. You know, it was always a struggle. So I'm actually interested to see that side of it because that's not my forte. So <laughs> even even I am I'm gonna look at that. So so when you wanna I know that you are blogging a lot now and you're speaking a lot now. So you're at a lot mm -hmm. of homeschool conventions. Matter of fact, it was hard to really get any time with you because you're at so many homeschool conventions <laughs> now. Yeah. yeah. So, but I know you have some some areas that you are really really passionate to talk about, and I know that one of them is working with moms and helping them um, prepare and go through the high school years. And we've got plenty of time. We literally have tons of time now. So let's slow it down a little bit, and now let's really focus on helping moms get through those high school years. What are some of the things, what are what are your most popular talks right now? When you're out in the convention world, what are some of your most com popular talks? And sort of g give us, you know, a, you know, bullet point or a little snippet from, from what you're, what you're hearing moms are struggling with, because we, you know, high school is scary. Yeah, it it's is. like you Starting all over again. You get. I mean, I've been homeschooling six years now. I have high school students. It's like, oh. So yeah we're, yeah, we're all paranoid going through high school. So help us. Well, my two probably some of my more t uh, my two most popular talks in that arena is, am I ruining my children? <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately, and because we all have felt that, haven't we? I mean, we just feel like if we don't, if we mess up in one specific area, they're just ruined, and we don't get a do over. Um, right. And then the other one is um, navigating the high school years, and that's more of a nuts and bolts, you know, transcripts and course direction and things like that. So those are my two more popular talks in the high school arena. Um, I think the the am I ruining my children? One of the things we have the biggest challenges with as homeschool moms is gaps. We're concerned for gaps. 
that our kids are going to be missing out on something. You know, either we feel you're laughing, Leanne. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason. <laughs> uh, it's so funny because Leanne is living this. She literally <laughs> has been struggling with this herself for the last couple of weeks. And I'm like, anyway, she, she had confirmation today that she's not ruining yes. her child. Good. <laughs> well, I tell you, I'm speaking on this stuff because I've lived it myself. And, you know, it got so badly that my kids especially because I didn't start speaking until they were in the high school years and they'd be like is this going to be another one of your talks <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd always ask them permission if I shared stuff but um, it really is real I mean we we can't know everything about everything as as instructors as directors for our children but we can certainly find places where they can get what they need that's that's you know everybody says oh well you know science so you've got it covered well I can't teach poetry or reading or language arts to, to anyway I just I'm seriously just <laughs> lacking but I found people yeah. who have that love and so we looked for places where they could get that instruction that I couldn't give them now regarding the gaps let me just tell you I mean for those of you who are in public school or private school did you ever really finish a book seriously I mean no <laughs> and so we, we we fool ourselves into thinking we're messing them up if we don't make it all the way through the book in a year we're we're, we're messing them up if they don't learn 13th century Chinese history. Um, we're, we're messing them up if they don't get an art class all the way through and a, you know, whatever, all the athletic sports. Music, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, goal, mm -hmm. the goal is to help them to learn to navigate what their passions are and their skills, to build mm -hmm. those skills, to build those, those, um, on those passions that they have, and to teach them how to learn. Because... If they know how to learn, then if they're missing something, they're going to go get it. They know where to get that information. Nobody knows everything about everything. That's okay? right. And so we need to realize that if they're used to being spoon-fed every day, Monday through Friday from 8.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon like they would in a brick-and-mortar school, they're learning how to be spoon-fed. Tell me what to do next. Tell me what to do next. But when we have the opportunity to say, what should you be doing next? Let them fail a little bit. Let them suffer a couple of consequences in a safe place so that they learn to become self-directed. They learn to become getters, learners, you know, gatherers of information. That builds them uh, those, those strengths that will benefit them whether they go college or career. People love that in a career environment. A go-getter, someone who says, well, I don't know what to do because nobody told me, that's just awful. But that's what, that's what employers are getting now. When they get a, an employee who says, I didn't know what to do, so I went and researched this, and I went and researched this, that they shine. They just shine. And that's why homeschoolers are being sought after by employers, hmm. that they have that skill. They have the character. So focus on character with them as well during these years. Work on your relationship with them during these years. Um, the goal is to continue to usher them in to become adults. So helping them learn how to navigate, I don't know, balancing a checkbook and, and changing their oil in a car and making something besides ramen noodles. Those are things that will really benefit them. And so, yes, the academics are important. We all know that, but we freak out about that part, and we sometimes miss out on the important things like character, a drive for learning how to learn. And those will be the things that will help benefit them when they get to college or into a career environment. Mm. So wise. Absolutely. Yes. Very wise. Um, we call those practical life skills. And um, we come from a Montessori background. Coincidentally, both Leanne and I both um, are from a Montessori world. And that's, they call it practical life and lifelong learning. So, yep, uh, we, we get that 100%. And that's actually one area that I feel good about. It's all those other areas you were talking about <laughs> that it scares me to death. When you said, when did you ever finish a book? I cannot tell you how many times Leanne has said that to me. <laughs> yes. That is yeah. our running joke. Is everybody says, when did, when did you ever finish a book in public school? And it's like, yeah, but I wanted to finish the book. I sure. really wanted to finish the book. <laughs> so, yeah, you get it. You get it. So I'm not the only one. If you're having that conversation at conventions, there's a lot of mamas saying the same thing. We all feel it. We yeah. do. Seriously, and it's not okay to say, well, then let's just give up. It's okay to say this is just a normal thing because we want our kids to excel, and so we want to do the best, and we feel like we're not meeting that, and we really are. I mean, they're getting so much more than you think they're getting, and especially mm -hmm. in the relationships they have with you, and that to me has been the best thing to see. Um, you know, I love, I remember um, a Christmas song 
over the holidays when my daughter was in middle school and it was the it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas and one of the phrases in the song is mom and dad can hardly wait for school to start again and my my daughter said we're not like that I'm like you're better believe it I can wait for school to start again I don't want Christmas break to end either you know I love summer break and I love Christmas break and I love doing it with my kids and they're not an inconvenience when they come home from school like they can be for a lot of families who are in that kind of an environment so um, I just feel like it's been such a blessing to be able to foster our relationships which then help us to continue to guide them into adulthood as after they graduate even they're willing to share their hearts with us and that's really what it's about so I agree 100% and I think that that's that's one of those areas that it's so easy especially for new homeschoolers to to get lost because we get so wrapped up in the curriculum and making sure that it's the right curriculum which of course there is no right you know everybody's right is different but uh, that is that is part of their there, um, I think it's just due to not knowing. The more you homeschool, the longer you homeschool, the more you realize that there's not a perfect curriculum and there's not a perfect solution. Um, what works great for this child won't necessarily even work great for the next child down the line, like That's we were right. talking about earlier. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I, I love that. That is that's you, some great wisdom. Um, one of the other things that I love that you talk a lot about that. I personally, um, be, being again a mom of high schoolers, is I have a I have one child. Well, all of them are. They're distractible. So help me, help. I know that's another area that you where you refer. Which one of your kids was distractible? Because I know you had to have one. That's the reason why you're writing about it. <laughs> yeah, I have two that are particularly. But one actually has been diagnosed ADHD. We didn't have him diagnosed until he was in eleventh grade because he asked for it because he knew it he wanted extra time on his SAT exams and he just had that and and you know we can get into a long debate on to whether you should do that or not whether you should medicate or not but I think really um, not going that direction but going into you've got this kid that is distracted my kids was distracted by wallpaper I'm serious <laughs> I, I tell you. I have one of those. I, I promise them, you I have one of those. I actually I had one of those three-sided uh, presentation boards because this was just something we were trying to get him through math when he was like in elementary school. And I put it on his desk and said, you know, this will keep you from distract, being distracted from your, your siblings. And I, I peek around the corner and watch him after like five minutes. And he's got his finger running up and down the ridges on the little corrugation. <laughs> I'm like, just, so here's what I did. I said, okay. How can a child who can sit for hours in front of a Lego model and work on that not sit for 15 minutes for a math quiz? And so I had this little brainstorm. I went and grabbed a model, a Lego model that had it had 17 steps. And I had a 20 question math quiz. And I chopped off the last three of the questions. And I said, I want you to do problem one and then step one of your Lego and then problem two and step two of your Lego. And he finished that quiz in 20 minutes. Now, wow, that was well, brilliant. That's well, great. That is great. <laughs> but yeah. he can't take a bucket of Legos to his SAT exam. So, <laughs> well, so, this is was, true. Yeah. So, so we, our goal was, I think, from that he learned I can do this. I, I, I'm able to. I mean, because distractible kids begin to think I'm just not able. I can't. I'm not smart enough. And really, they are. They're just taking in information from so many places that they can't it's like you know hearing a giant band playing while you've got somebody massaging your back while you're riding a bicycle trying to stay balanced while people are throwing tennis balls at you and you have to recite the ABCs you know that's what distractible kids go through I mean they're just so much input they can't process it and so they begin to think I just can't I'm just not smart and that's tr not true they're usually very very intelligent so our goal is to help them understand that they can do things, that they're able to do things. And then we just slowly navigate with, you know, this didn't work for you. Let's try this. And let's, let's try this. Have them suggest maybe certain places in the house if they're reading a uh, certain way. Sometimes the auditory helps if they've got to read aloud alongside of their text um, or, you know, they take turns reading with a sibling. Helping them to determine what works best for them, and so my one particular child um, knew that he just could not focus, and so he wanted to be tested so he could apply for more time for his SAT exams. And so anybody who's considering that, I recommend you do it 
at least starting in ninth or tenth grade because it takes a good year to go through all that process, and then it takes another extra to get you know to get the College Board to accept it. But they can get up to a time and a half or more for their exams, and then they also can get more time in college as well. Colleges will usually allow students to have someone take notes for them, to have extra time on their exams in a testing center. So there's a lot of accommodations for students who truly have those um, challenges, but it's not because they're not smart. And I think that's our goal is to help them see that they can, they're able. And being in a homeschool environment, they have that advantage because they are not being compared with 30 other kids who are excelling in different ways. They're excelling for themselves at their best rate. And so um, I just feel like distractible children are more of a challenge for mom and dad, but certainly uh, can shine, can shine. We just need to help them see that. Mm, that's so smart. Mm -hmm. So from from the – you ha are you going to end up writing a book about that? Because I know you've got a couple of articles on it, right? I do. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of swamped. Right now I'm working on Instructable DVD series for Apologia. So I just came out with the Biology DVD instruction series, um, Human Anatomy, and I'm working on Chemistry right now. And so – I'm praying about what God wants me to write about next, book-wise, but, um, but we'll see. I, I would love to. I'd, I'd at least love to come and speak on it to places because I feel like it's an issue that we all are concerned about as moms. Mm -hmm. I know. And that's the, that's the son that's getting ready to go off for the master's program, and that's the son that has the printable for the, for the right. arms and things for children, right? No, the, the, the distracted child is my musician. The prosthetic oh. child is my Saul of Tarsus, which is another entire story. Mm. Oh, you have to tell us that. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> the hard, he's like the hard-headed, I am right, and challenging, challenging child. Uh, very challenging to raise. Um, and, and yet, you know, I, I call him my Saul of Tarsus child because think about Saul in the Bible who was just so on fire to persecute the Christian church because he believed with every fiber of his being this you know that they were you know um, heretical and then when when he met Christ he just did a complete 180 and was completely on fire but this time for Christ and his word and so that that driven super headstrong stubborn lovely child that's my that's my arm guy he calls himself a small small arms dealer which I absolutely love <laughs> but, that is too funny. Oh my gosh, I love that. Yeah. So oh. that, that's um that was a challenge too. And I remember telling myself when he was little, I got I we're all moms here. I got really good at disciplining a child while nursing a baby at the same time. I could do this. So, <laughs> but I kept telling myself for the sixteenth time today, if I don't get up and do it now, I can't do it when he's thirteen and bigger than I am. I need to, to hit it during these younger years to pursue him, to, um, to help him to understand the importance of bowing the knee before Christ, understanding that there's authority over him. He's got police officers he's going to have to obey one day, you know, taxes he's going to have to file whether he likes it or not. And so that kind of um, continuous pursuing him, I kept telling myself I was pursuing him. I wasn't... Um, I get frustrated because sometimes we get no school done. All I was doing was disciplining all day. I feel like I put on my my referee shirt, you know, the striped shirt that referees wear with the whistle. And the, I feel like I was doing that every day sometimes because my kids came within a period of six years, four kids in six years. It was insane. But wow. I pursued him because I knew that God had something fabulous for him. I knew that um, that if I got his heart, that he would do amazing things. And, and He's doing some amazing things right now. It's a small arms dealer. He's yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that was a that's that's amazing. Um, and I, I did the same thing except I had three kids in four years, so Ooh, I sort of yeah, did, yeah I did the same thing. <laughs> uh, but and they're all boys, so I I get that. Boy, do yeah. I get that. Oh yeah. Mm, 
Mm -mm. Okay, so so you have a Soul of Tarsus. So you so you have nicknames yeah. for them. See, I'm learning as I go. We have nicknames. We have Soul of Tarsus, <laughs> and we have the Distractible Child. We have two more kids that we haven't identified here. So tell us the stories about um, them. <laughs> they, they don't have names necessarily. They just got snippets of things here and there. I have one just like me. That's that. That's a good name. Just like me. Oh, <laughs> I have one just like me too. Like Aren't me. they fun? <laughs> they are fun. I learned. <laughs> I'm really a mess. I need. To, I couldn't live with another man. I'm, you know, I'm having to. So, I'm amazing. doing the same thing. Oh. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I, I, I'll, I'll, good. Good. No, you're fine. Go ahead. It, it's interesting just how God shows us parts of ourselves as parents. You know, if I was not a parent, well, I have my first child was a very, um, as a very good, you know, traditional firstborn wanted to please slept through the night at six weeks. I was like the most prideful parent in the world, thinking, how do these, you know, these moms, I've got this. This is just so amazing. You know, I'm such a great mom. And then my second one comes, and I'm like, whoa. And then my third one comes, I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I realized, wow, I just really am a mess. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful for all the things that God is teaching me through parenting my kids because, yeah, that, that just like me child is like, wow. I'm really, yeah, I'm really needing the Lord, so. Mm -hmm. Well, is that yes. your baby? That's my baby, yes. yes. I, mine too, my, like mine too. <laughs> I'm like, woo, I t we are having some challenges, and uh, last night I told her that. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you a secret. My sister said, uh, by the time I was two years old, they knew I was not going to be compliant, and <laughs> my sister is 18 years older than me, so she gets the luxury of seeing, you know, me telling me about that stuff. She said, by the time you were two, we knew you were not going to be compliant, and I'm like, wow, yeah, that's that's my young one. So I'm getting it in spades, and so, yeah, I, if my mom was still alive, I guess I would have to apologize, but, you know, I mean, it's how we're made. It's, it's you know, I mean, at two years old, come on, I wasn't able to make decisions at that age about not being compliant. So, but this one, yeah, he's 11. He he can make, he's making decisions now, y'all. So, whoo wee. So okay, so so what's you have one just like me. So the oldest one it was the compliant one, he's and the, the young one. Is, one. Yeah. 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 yeah, mine was that way too. It's interesting. I wonder, you know, there's a birth order, birth order books. I wonder if, um, if they really are that close to sticking to the birth order because mine are. Or it sounds yeah. like yours are. I think there's a generalization, yes, that they can be, and I think it's important for us to understand our kids too. Their both their mm -hmm. personalities and some of those those natures that they get as as based on their birth order or the, being female or male. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for us to learn about their strengths, their likes. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them are, are really strong readers. Some of them are not. Some of them love to talk a million miles an hour, and some of them are just really quiet. And so understanding that um, is the beauty, again, of homeschooling because we can, we can approach them from a different angle. I approach all four of my kids differently because... Um, I know how they are wired. I know what their loves are. What their some of them are just real cuddly and touchy, and others, you know, pat mom on the head. I, I love you, mom. I mean, they're all taller than me, so they pat me on the head. Mm -hmm. But but it is it's <laughs> it's, um, it's important. And I think there are some trends. I think there's things we can understand. You know, there's certain books, and there's some great books out there on their personalities and their love languages. And personally, my love language is chocolate and red velvet cake. But yeah, uh -huh. as I'm looking at my gels, yeah, apparently for me too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it is. It's really it's important to get to know, them, and we get to know them because we're with them. We have time with them. You know, people talk about quality time versus quantity time. It really is hard to have quality time without the quantity. You know, you can't just have a kid come home for an hour before they go to bed after doing three hours of homework and say, okay, quality time, do it. Because that happens. It just occurs. You can't make it happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, um, that's another reason why I love homeschooling. We are in the, in the business of building the next generation and the, be the best way we can and with the best resources that we have available to us. And I think God honors that. In spite of us, God honors that. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. He fills in the gaps. I agree. Yeah. So, so what are the things that you are most passionate about? I know that moms have things that they are, are struggling with, but what do you what do you love to talk about? I know obviously marine biology is one of your lives. Your kids are one of your lives. But really, what what makes Sherry tick? I mean, I think that's important for us to when we're when we're getting to know people. I love to find out what makes them tick. So, okay. what are your what are you passionate about? Well, I have two areas that I'm super passionate about. One is, is a sciencey one. It's helping people see God in science. I love, I love learning about science. I actually started. Um, I was a brand new Christian when I was in college, and I was reading my Bible for the first time as I was taking a course titled Evolution. So I'm reading <laughs> Darwin's Origin of Species at the same time I'm reading the Bible, and I'm trying to to fix make those two fit, and I just couldn't. And it was just so cool because God began me on a, a path of apologetics through that. Why is you know, How do we see God and how do we see his fingerprints in creation? And so I love writing, I love talking about that. Um, just helping, because people, I think a lot of times Christians will say, well, we're just not going to talk about it. God made everything, we're good. They're afraid of science because they're afraid that it might waver their faith and um, and it's just not, that's just not right. There's, there's so much out there that points to a creator God. And there's so much that our scientific community publicizes that's just outright wrong. I mean, it's a faith that they have as well. And so that's something I'm really passionate about. And I could talk for hours about that. And another one is for moms. You know, when you had initially introduced me, you said that I was promoted to mother. Mm -hmm. I feel like I talk to a lot of moms who say, well, I'm just a mom. And they feel like they have to do something else along with being home with their kids and educating them. And that's one of the reasons why I titled my blog Just Extraordinary, because we are just, but that justness is extraordinary. That's what makes us amazing, is that that day to day. I mean, you know, you've got people have 15 minutes of fame here or there or whatever, but really what we're doing is we're raising the next generation of, of people who are going to take over the world. And that's our best mission field. That's our best endeavor. That's our best production, if you want to call it that. You know, mm -hmm. books are nothing in comparison to that. Speaking is nothing in comparison to that. And moms feel like they have to do more. And so when I hear a mom say, I'm just a mom, it just it makes me want to just say, no, don't use that word. Because there's so much to that in, in the way that God has designed us and given us the, um, the privilege of doing what we're doing. So I love, love talking about that. Well, you know, um, and I got that when when I read your bio, I completely got that because here you are working at one of the, um, I guess, the top ten companies in the world, um, and I, it probably fluctuates with Walmart and a couple of other ones up there, probably in the top five. And um, you are, you know, living that romantic dream life that you know you said it wasn't, but whatever, we think it was. <laughs> it was. I'll Okay, and you know, like going off on these wonderful islands, and you know, swimming with dolphins. I mean, come on, we know you did that too. And I did. so, um, so yeah, we're we're a little bit jealous of that. But at the same time, here you are saying you got promoted to motherhood. So that really, I think that speaks to where your heart is. It shows what what your uh, passion is. So, but I'm interested. You mentioned the fingerprints and creation. Um, obviously, we don't have enough time to go through a whole presentation on that, but. Tell us one area that you felt, especially from a marine biology perspective, that science can't explain, that the only way you can explain it is an intelligent creator or God. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I put you on the spot about, good enough. Yeah, I mean, talk I'm about trying, putting yeah. you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to pick one. There's so many. Um, seriously, there's so many. I, I'll talk about dolphins because everybody loves dolphins. And everybody knows that dolphins can echolocate, right? They, right? they send out sounds that bounce off of things and come back, and that enables them to um, catch their food, which is a critical life-requiring thing. Um, they use it for communication. They use it to school. They use it to, to do all, all kinds of things as well that are very important, but mostly it's important for eat, eating. They need to do that to eat. If they can't echolocate, they can't find their food. They can't eat in right. the quantities of food that they need. And so when you look at the mechanisms that, a dolphin needs to echolocate. It has a separate pathway for eating and breathing. You know, we have the same because mm -hmm. if we can't, if we take inhale while we're eating, we choke, right? right? They have to eat and breathe at the same time. So they have separate pathways. Their larynx extends to their blowhole. They have strong muscular nasal plugs that make a that squealy sound. You fill up a balloon and not tie it off and hold right. the mouthpiece and makes that squeal sound. That's what they use to that squealy sound. They have um, 
a lens which is their forehead that's made of fatty tissue to focus and they have a jaw that extends into their inner ear so they can hear that their jaw is what they actually use to receive sounds. We do that same as well. If you ever heard yourself recorded before and you say that's not what I sound like but everybody else says yes it is, that's because we're used to hearing our voice as the sound travels through our neck, up through our jaw and into our ear and it sounds different than traveling through air which is how other people hear us. And so, I don't want to hear that. Darn, that means I really am that country. You didn't have to say that. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry. sorry. Keep okay. going. So all, all of those things, all those mechanisms have to be in place at the same time for a dolphin to echolocate. If one of them is diminished or gone, it can't. And so evolution says... How does that evolve? Well, yeah. Yeah, that how, how does evolve that evolve? One tiny piece at a time. And so some evolutionists will say, well, all of those pieces were used for something else and then became necessary for echolocation. But we're talking about multiple organs that all of a sudden were using, doing something else that wasn't needed any longer at one time that all came together in this amazing system so dolphins could echolocate. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be explained using the process of evolution. And that's why the definition of evolution changes every single year because they keep finding um, evidence that crushes their definition and so they'll reassess their definition and, and so um, that's just one that's one tiny thing and we know that you know dolphins are amazing in their ability to echolocate here's a really quick story when I was working at the aquarium I was I became pregnant with our first child and I continued working for for six months before I finally quit but I couldn't dive any longer and so during feeding time um, I would wade out into a platform at, uh, and just broadcast food over the surface while other divers were, were diving and feeding. And about a month into that, the dolphins would come up to me when I wait on the platform and they would knock into my knees and push on me and knock me and push me out of the water. They wouldn't let, and we thought they were being playful because they're ridiculously playful. They'd pull our air hoses out of our mouths because they like the bubbles. <laughs> and so, they were, um, and so I had, we had another person go out onto the platform. We thought maybe there was something wrong with the platform. They didn't bother that person. And so we know that they can identify what things are made of by this echo that comes back. And we think, we don't know for sure, but we think that they can identify the second heartbeat and that they had a natural instinct Aww. to protect me from the sharks that were in the aquarium as well because there were sharks <gasps> in the aquarium at the same time. And so it just is a natural instinct that they had because they have this keen ability to know what things are made out of by the echoes. They cannot survive without that yeah. and we cannot explain it any other way than a designer. And that's just yeah. one of probably, I can think of over a hundred things right now, literally, that I could mention. So um, wow. I love sharing that with people. Hmm. And you know, um, so many times we hear scientists, and we and we think of scientists as not being, not believing. Or you know, I mean, I guess that's probably the one field that if you think doctors and yeah. scientists, and yeah. of course they're all related, um, are probably the one field that you hear the most about that aren't believers. So it's it's uh, pretty amazing to have um, such a such a obviously accomplished scientist who also is a believer. So mm -hmm. that's sort of cool. They're so out yeah, there. you're you're an you're you're an apologetic um, <laughs> speaker, whether that's actually anything that's on your resume, it it just happens naturally. That's yeah. that's amazing. So yeah, I love that. Well, so Leanne, did you, I know you've been sitting over there being so quiet. Did, have you had you tried to pop in once and I stepped on you. Did you have a question? No, 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 no. My, my, um, it, are, do y'all see two of me at the bottom? No. You're okay. There. Well, my, my, my screen, my screen shows me as there twice, and my, my internet keeps bobbing in and out, so I can't even get on the Twenty Two Social to see if there are questions right now, because <laughs> oh, it no. keeps. So if y'all are watching and you have questions, and we're we're really not ignoring you, so mm, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get Sherry to go over there and look afterwards and see if there's any questions. She'll help us answer them, right, Sherry? It's over yeah, on the absolutely. apology page, so we'll be there after yeah. after the call. Yeah. So anyway, okay. Well, I wanted to make sure I wasn't I wasn't uh, keeping you yeah. from talking. So okay. Not so no. the uh, the other thing about um, you said that your other passion is the just mom, you know, and and helping her walk through not calling herself that. What do you say to them? I mean, I. I we heard your snippet, but what, what is it that, um, how do you help them walk through that and get past that and realize how important this job is? I mean, it is the most important job. I mean, period. This is the most important job. And I walked away from my business, as we talked about, um, for this very reason. So how do you help people understand that? How do you help moms get it? 
Well, I help them understand, okay, if you, I'll ask them things like, if you could do anything you wanted in the world, career-wise, what would it be? Let's say you could get the, the, the plum job for you. What would it be? Because it's usually career that they're thinking about. And um, then they, they'll, they'll tell me, well, I'd love to be this or I'd love to do that. Sometimes they say, I don't know, but I'd love to do something successful. I say, okay, well, let's say that you attain that. Let's say you get there and you're able to do that um, every day. Um, but you have these kids that are in school and they're doing other things. Um, some people are able to make that work. And I'm not saying that all moms should be at home all the time. I'm not, I'm not trying to right. put down any moms that are working. But I'm right. trying to help people value what they're doing. And so, um, you know, I remember when I was working in the workplace, I had friends, I had some coworkers, and we'd connect. But it was also surface. It was also, um, you know, some of it was was competition. There's always competitiveness. So people would be your friend because they wanted something from you or they wanted to use you as a stepping stone to get someplace else. There was some superficialness because they just they just liked you or wanted to be near you because of some other thing or they had to, you know, because you're employed by them. Um, so when they really get a realistic picture of what day-to-day -day a career position looks like that they think would be fulfilling for them, I help them to realize, is that fulfilling? What What is fulfilling to you? What makes what just fulfills and melts your heart? What fills your heart up? And oftentimes, then they realize, well, being my family, or, you know, my kid says, I love, I love you, mom, or when we're just, you know, at the beach, just relaxing together. It's never when I've completed, you know, arguing my case before the Supreme Court. I mean, that's, that's, that might be a few moments, of, but it's just, it really, when people finally get to those positions, even people in those positions now will say, that's not it. There's more. There's more missing. You know, um, there's all kinds of statistics I could throw at them. You know, one of the most prosperous um, professional countries, Japan, um, where people are, that goal is to get there and make the money and get the positions. The suicide rate is the highest there because once they get there, they realize this isn't what I thought it was. This is not fulfilling. And so... I help them to try to see what what fulfills you, what fills your sails. Now, God is great, gracious in giving us opportunities to do extra things, to minister to others, to maybe start a small business, or to you know do some crafts or or gardening or whatever it is that moms love. Maybe it's writing, maybe it's um, part time job kind of stuff as well. Um, and I think that's important too because I think that the Bible talks about us being industrious. Women and moms in the homes should be industrious. But that's not the be-all, end-all because we're not doing it to make a name for ourselves. We're doing it to fulfill what God's got for us in ministry. And what's our greatest ministry? It's our children and our, and our husbands. And so that's just helping them to get that perspective um, I think is important. We all need that. I need that too. It's easy to fall into the, oh, so-and-so is doing this too and I'm not then I'm not as good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm just doing this. And, I mean, you know, we all know this. Competition, you know, we should never compare our kids with other kids. We should never compare our kids with our their siblings. We should never compare ourselves with other moms as well. We fall into that comparison trap, and it's just, it just, it just um, deflates us. There's nothing beneficial from knowing what the other person is doing. And believe me, the grass is not greener. It's not. We only see the Facebook picture perfect images and the beautiful dinner that they made. Never mind that they had cereal for dinner last night. You know, it's it's <laughs> if cereal for dinner. <laughs> cereal for dinner is cheaper than therapy for mom. I'm just saying. That's right. <laughs> it is. But you know, we, we get ourselves into that comparison. I think that's where the just comes from. We we compare and we say, well, I'm not doing what this one is. But God doesn't have that for you. Maybe He's got something else, and it's amazing. And you need to see what that is and pray about it and, and seek it. And, and there's no lesser endeavor. Um, if, if it's where God wants you to be, that's the best spot to be. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to keep telling ourselves that. You know, the, the Proverbs 31 woman had people working in her house with her. And it describes her over her entire life, not just in a moment. And so we, we have that goal of doing all those amazing things. My children hopefully will rise up and call me blessed when I'm dead. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> kind of what I'm hoping for <laughs> because I'm still working through all those things that she did because it was over a lifetime. And so it's not it's not the got to get it by the time I'm 25 or I'm done. And uh, we need to realize that we have so much value in what we do. 
and need to tell ourselves that and need to tell each other that too mm -hmm. and not compete. It's not a war. It's not a battle. My kids are going where God wants them and your kids are going where God wants them and it's going to look different for every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And so we encourage each other and be joyful when someone else succeeds because that just blesses the whole community, the whole the whole Christian community, the whole homeschool community, and and people's perceptions of moms in our culture. That's right. That's right. We um, Hip Hop School Moms, of course, has a community which you're in, and um, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is be there to encourage each other, to help each other, because um, what we have found is that so many moms actually we feel very lonely. We feel very uh, segregated. Even even if you're in a homeschool community, you can still feel very segregated. Um, for various reasons, it may not. It just may be your personality to not be outgoing and be in you know the mix of all the social things that are happening around you. And so, um, our community really has become a lifeline, and, and we we started it for that very reason, for that exact reason that you mm -hmm. just said that they needed you know to be lifted up. So, well, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed hanging out and talking with you. Um, I do have some some closing thoughts that I would like to um, get you to to talk about because you mentioned it a few minutes ago about the new apologia stuff. Now, how do you fit in with the apologia academy? Are these DVDs going to be used there for the at your own pace? I mean, what? How does that all work? I don't know where you. I don't explain. Okay, okay. The Academy is a real-time class you go to once a week for with an instructor that um, instructs, takes your test, and they show PowerPoints. You're watching them kind of like you're watching us right now in a tiny right. little screen, and they have a, a PowerPoint they can write on or pop up okay. some images. These are different. These are for students to buy. It's a four-computer DVD set that you play on a computer. They're MP4s, and it takes you through section by section, in the course, instruction, section by section, it shows videos of all of the labs done. I'm doing every single lab, so you can see them happen, so you know what to expect. And then we go out places and look at things. So in the biology DVD, we, um, I got to swim with whale sharks in the Caribbean. I got video up in Iceland. Of some, Apologia uh, sent you there. Well, really? <laughs> Jeez. I need, to, I need to become your assistant. Now I know who's assistant I want to be. Now we yeah. know. Okay. No, it's, <laughs> Much of these trips are, like when, I, when I'm going to speak at homeschool conferences, I do a search, what's out there? Like, I'm doing the chemistry DVD right now, and um, I'm going to Colorado for, for some, a conference, and so I'm going to be filming at a gold mine. I'm going to hey, be filming at the top of Mount Evans, fun. which is a 14,000-foot oh mountain. So uh, you can look at the sky and see the atmosphere because the atmosphere is so thin, you see dark when you look up. It's, so there's a lot of great places in the area and so when I'm going to Niagara Falls um, in another week to speak at in um, Ohio, and so we're going to zip up to Ohio to Niagara Falls and film film there. So as I'm going to these conferences, I'm like, what is there that we can talk about to just bring science home to students? When we talk about the human heart, I'm I'm holding the head of a giraffe that I'm feeding and talking about how a giraffe's heart is, is so big and how a giraffe's uh, circulatory system behaves to help them understand how our circulatory system behaves. Mm -hmm. So it, they're video clips and animations that go along with the instruction of the of the course. So it's not it's not necessarily PowerPoint dots, but you see images and you see videos that take you section by section. Wow. And so this is something that you go at your own pace. You just it's just to have a student can can watch section by section if they if they're not understanding it, they can watch it again, they can pause it, they can rewind it. And so that's what we're offering now with um, hopefully with all of our courses. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I still am jealous. I want to go with you. So you just holler when you when you if you start doing this for marine biology. You, have you already got one for marine biology? No, Darn. it's coming out. It's coming out, Lord willing, soon. Okay, well, you know, I you know who I, who's over here volunteering, okay. right? No. <laughs> <laughs> the beach girl. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's fantastic. I was, I, I had not had a chance to even talk to Mel, ask her how these all work together. And I know that y'all have been working on these. Every time I, every time I'm on the phone with her or dealing with Michelle, she's off doing some kind of video, you know, recording stuff. And I'm like, what are they doing over there? So yeah. this is what y'all have been working on. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, my son, my oldest son, just finished biology, but I have two more going through. So I will be watching for that. So yeah, he's getting ready to start. Absolutely. We did something really bizarre with the way we did our 
biology this year. We finished all the modules, and now we're going back and doing all the dissections. Is that oh, normal? Yeah. That's sometimes very normal. I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the book is written as a tool for you to use which best fits your family. And so I tell families that all the time, um, especially with our courses. You know, the labs are interspersed throughout the module. And, you know, your kid comes up to you, hey, Mom, I need purple cabbage today. And you're like, I'm not really? going to the grocery store today. Sorry. <laughs> and so I would just, I would. And that's just, not one yeah. of those staples that I have in my house. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. So, again, I would, I would tell moms, you know, look ahead. If you know you're spending two weeks for a chapter, Every other week on a Tuesday is the day you buy the stuff you need for the labs. And just tell your kids, we're doing them on that Tuesday or that Wednesday or whatever it is. You know, skip it until we get to it. And because life, I mean, seriously, it, we've yeah. got life that, that interferes with some of that and reality. And so use the book as a tool, not as your commander, you know. That's, well, that's I think... Fun. I'm sort of using it, my, I'm actually using it and saying, well, you know, this is review. We're reviewing by doing it this way. So either you remember it, and if you don't remember it, then we have to go back and study that chapter a little bit more. So, good. yeah, right. Very that's, good. My, that's, my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we have reached the end of our time. I could go on and on and on and on, especially picking your brain about science and about high school. But I have, we have so enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anything you want to close with that we didn't cover? Do you feel like we covered everything that you wanted to talk about? Um, we hit the high points of everything, yes. I think so. Um, just keep going. Okay. I mean, seriously, day by day, step by step. Yeah. Okay, y'all yeah. can find her, of course, at Apologia, but you can also find her at her blog, which is just-extraordinary.com. And I'm going to go get your book. I'm going to go get it this afternoon. So thank <laughs> you. I enjoy talking with you, and thanks again. And we will yeah, sure. uh, be back with another. We talked about the Apology Academy. We actually will be interviewing him, um, I guess, it was rescheduled. It was supposed to be last week, so we're gonna we're gonna be interviewing him. So I won't be so ignorant about the academy from here on out. <laughs> but I am right now for obvious reasons. So anyway, <laughs> thanks y'all for being here. We enjoy it. We love getting to know the people behind Apologia, and Absolutely. we love that curriculum. We're all big fans over here. So uh, we just we feel very blessed that Apologia is such a big part of the homeschool community. So thanks for doing all that y'all do. We're glad. Our pleasure. Okay. Well, we will see y'all the next time we have a Google Hangout, which I think is in another week. So y'all have a great week, and we will talk to you later. Bye.